had a window. I was a squatter in hearing room 506. The office was empty. Claims for the space were under review, stalled by state bureaucratic snarl. I was bold, took what should be mine. The other hearing officers were angry that I, a transfer of only a few months, could see the outside. They filed petitions to the bosses in Albany. Those without windows did not speak to me, even to say hello. The friends of those without windows did not speak to me, even to say hello. My requests for an ergonomic chair were thwarted. But I had a window. I could see scaffolding. I could see the swirling litter of downtown Brooklyn. I could see buildings being torn down. I could see weather. I was elated. Then the email circulated. I was being moved to a small, hot, windowless nook in the back northwest corridor of the 14th floor. And now this is where I sit, over the HVAC, under the yellow asbestos drenched tiles on my ill-fitting ergonomic chair. <laughs> this is not an obituary for Claudia Card. Claudia, you asked me in advance to write your obituary. You gave me your 37-page single-spaced CV. Now the time has come. I have not written your obituary. After the biopsy results last year, you said I would inherit your music library. I used to play piano. I stopped playing piano in 1984. You nominated me for a graduate fellowship. You said I would have been a good philosopher. I got the fellowship, thank you. Then, as you know, I dropped out. I went back to New York, eventually to law school, to pursue a mediocre career. After your lung surgery, you told your other visitors that I was a judge. You seemed so proud, Claudia. I kept telling you, administrative judge. <laughs> In the 90s, I took you on a walking tour all over Manhattan. You developed plantar fasciitis from the hard city pavement. I took your ethics class in 1984. You held the chalk like the cigarettes you used to chain smoke. Your mother died of lung cancer. You told me your family was so poor, she barely went to the doctor. The lung tumor protruded from her chest by the time she got someone to look at it. So in 1989, I lied when you asked me if I smoked. I still have the coat and blazer I bought the day I gave you plantar fasciitis. I don't have the letters you wrote or the papers you sent me. The last time I ever saw you, I hugged you goodbye when my taxi arrived to take me to the airport. You were in bed, cancer in your brain, maybe your spine. My heavy backpack fell over me onto your abdomen. When they moved you to hospice, you told me on the phone you'd rather I come see you again at this new facility than come to your funeral. I didn't visit you at hospice. I didn't go to your funeral. So this is an old poem, but I'm considering it as a new poem because I've never read it. So I, I wrote it right after I was fired from a job. Or no, right before I was fired. <laughs> okay. And speaking of strategic planning, yesterday's meeting was not to be believed. So invigorating, it sent some over the edge. The rollout agenda ambitious, the deadlines aggressive. Implementing critical initiatives at this critical juncture is critical, said Troy from operations. 37 glossy 11 by 17 pie charts. Beverly from licensing wore a long blouse over her tattoos. Vicky from finance wore pink. Key 
is to strike a balance, said George, Chief Associate Deputy to the Deputy Associate Chief of Analysis and Audits, <laughs> between the objectives and goals, objectives of goals and the goals of objectives. Fran from Communication presented a soft launch of the new mission in song. Then Wanda from Data dimmed the lights. PowerPoint blue engulfed the northwest wall. The anticipation unbearable Margaret from research ran out. Oh, the pressure, the pressure. The new logo was red and black. It spoke to everyone. Enforcement saluted. Collections cried. It brought legal to their knees. <laughs> the, new lo the new logo was red and black. It was purple, had shadows of teal, a touch of magenta when you stared for three seconds, then looked away and blinked each eye separately. This one is called Theodora of Red Mill Farms, 1976. Shortly after the defunction of my father's bicentennial fruitcake, my parents decided it was time to breed our standard poodle. Theodora of Red Mill Farms was her name, Theo for short. This, after several years of Theo's fertile blood drops on the white tile hallway floor, my mother trailing behind her with a rag, cursing my father. And after my father discovered that his underwear served an excellent additional purpose to catch the blood with a ready-made hole for Theo's stubby tail, who needs to buy bitches britches when you have fruit of the loom, he posted. It was a school night. I was 11. Theo was in heat. The standard poodle stud arrived with his humans at our Henry Street apartment. Like Theo, the stud had black curly hair which matched my mother's perm. My father took the underwear off of Theo. The grown-up humans stood in the living room, cajoling the dogs to meet. I sat on the couch, along the cleared living room perimeter, my two-year-old sister next to me. I watched as the stud mounted my dog, as he thrusted his huge, bright red rod into my dog. I watched as the grown-up humans cheered. <laughs> This one's my last poem. It's called Michigan Women's Music Festival, 1989. Shortly after dropping out of graduate school, and after my mother sent my father from New York to rescue me from the Midwest lesbians, I attended a festival. There were 8,000 women. Most were lesbian. Many were naked. I went topless, but not bottomless. I went with friends who quickly found new friends. I sat by myself, too stiff to dance to the music, even though it was a music festival. I watched others dance and make out, tall, skinny blondes wearing nothing but hiking shoes and belts swaying to Holly Near with large shaved Amazons wearing rope sandals and cloth fig leaves. I waited on long lines alone, lines to use the port veins which reeked, lines for showers, which were cold, lines for food, which hosted a bacteria, making several sick, and then the thunder. Sweet honey and the rock was rained out. I got lost trying to find my tent, wandered through the S&M encampment, women in dog collars huddled under tarps. When I found my tent, the floor was covered with filthy rainwater and floating cigarette butts. My tent mate, my only hope of intimacy, had found a dry tent and moved out. Thank you.